So this is the Carl Icahn Laboratory, and it is the home for the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Genomics. Integrative Genomics, what is that? So integrative genomics is, is a brand new field of molecular biology that was created because of the Human Genome Project. So we sequence the human genome, three billion bases of DNA, When I look back and think about what I'm most happy about are, are the uh, young and now middle-aged scientists who have gone on to uh, very successful careers in science. I think for anybody who combines research and teaching, uh, our greatest product are our students. How and why did you first get fixed on science? You know, I think it goes all the way back to extremely early childhood where I loved numbers. I love puzzles of all kinds, but particularly mathematical puzzles. So I think it was just loving playing with numbers. And what made you, what made your name in science? I think it was a, um, a set of experiments that I did as a postdoctoral fellow at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, this was at the very early days of recombinant DNA. This huge breakthrough, this ability to reach into a genome and pull out a single gene and then study its structure was suddenly possible. And I was in a laboratory of a man named Philip Leder, one of the country's great, great scientists, who had given me the project of doing this for the very first time. And after a lot of stumbles and a lot of blind alleys, uh, we were able to isolate a gene and for the very first time, see how a gene is organized and structured. And if it had been as we had predicted, based on what we knew, um, it would have been a wonderful thing, but it wouldn't have been as exciting as what we discovered when we looked at this gene, which was that it was organized completely differently than what we thought. And it it was one of those you know, earth-shattering moments where you realize, once again, Mother Nature had thrown you a curveball and had done something that took us years and years to really understand. Well, from that, and it hasn't been that long ago, we now have this wonderful and, to me, mysterious world of synthetic biology. Yes. And I think it's really um, an exciting opportunity to put biology to work for the good of mankind. You know, scientists are now trying to engineer bacteria so that they will be able to very effectively eat oil spills. So can you imagine what it would have meant in the Gulf if we had been able to just sprinkle some bacteria onto that horrible oil spill, that BP oil spill, and have that oil disappear within a matter of days. Normal bacteria don't do that, of course, but, but we now think that there may be ways of engineering bacteria so that they are able to do it. There are ways of describing that that sound a little brave new worldy, but I think the scientists who are really working on it are trying to mobilize biological systems for the betterment of mankind. But the flip side of that is in the hands of a terrorist, it has that potential as well when you can create what only nature previously created. I think that's right. But I don't think that there is anything new about that risk. There were many periods in the 20th century where a scientific discovery could have been used, and in some cases was used for destruction. The atomic bomb is obviously the best example of that. But in the hands of wise you know, policymakers, the power of that science can be directed toward good uh, in the case of nuclear energy. Um, so I, th I think what you're saying is absolutely true about synthetic biology, but I think that's always going to be true with a scientific discovery. And this building was built when? This was uh, built in 2003. And it doesn't just have molecular biologists in it. It has computer scientists, it has chemical engineers, it has physicists, it has 
biophysicists, and the whole purpose of creating this building was to bring all of these disciplines together because the new biology is a very different kettle of fish than the old biology, and it needs interactions with all of these other disciplines. And the biggest difference between biology today and the old biology, you called it, is? Big data. Big data. Big data. So what the genome sounds project- Sounds like a mafia boss or something. <laughs> I know, it sounds slightly uh, daunting, but it sort of this change where we can create more data than we can actually analyze at any given time. And so a lot of what goes on in this building is both generating the data, but then we have a whole nother group of people who are trying to figure out better ways to extract new knowledge out of the data. It's a sea change in biology. Well, question about big data. Is this a field for employment of people who study in science? Yes. And probably the biggest growth industry right now in biology, the biggest growth field, are individuals who have really deep quantitative skills. So computer scientists, physicists, who can bring their toolkits, which they learn in graduate school, to bear on biological problems. It's popularly believed in many parts of the country that we're producing all kinds of first-rate scientists who are gonna be set up for life in a pretty good job. What's wrong with that picture? The picture is, is I would say, um, very field-specific. That picture is absolutely true in areas like computer science and electrical engineering. There's no question, those are really growth industries. Um, if you look at my own field, which is biomedical science, the picture is much more um, cloudy, I would say. Well, does or does not the United States have a shortage of scientists? In biomedical science, I think the answer is clearly no. We do not have a shortage. Um, and in fact, I think you could make a pretty compelling argument right now that we are training more than we need to do the kinds of jobs that we're training them to do. And so I think one of the big debates in the field right now is whether we need to be changing the nature of our graduate education in biomedical science so that we are better preparing those students for the the real jobs that are out there for PhDs. In what other areas of science have we perhaps produced too many PhDs? Physics, chemistry? You know, I'm a great admirer of the physics community itself. And probably 20 years ago, the physics community took a look at the career prospects of its PhD graduates and saw, I think correctly, that uh, they were beginning to overproduce PhDs in physics. Uh, what the community did together is it exercised a little birth control. And so it actually reduced uh, the number of students it was producing. And as a consequence, I think there is a reasonable steady state that now exists in physics. And I think it's very healthy for the field. And I think it's something that biomedical science, which has not been able to exercise birth control, ironically, uh, given that it should understand birth control, if you look at chemistry, chemistry has been at steady state for at least 20 years. And by that, it means that it is producing roughly the same number of PhDs every year. And the evidence that those PhDs are finding good productive jobs, jobs that take advantage of their education, is good. They are producing roughly the right number of PhDs for what the economy can absorb. I thought biomedicine, biotech, was going to be the boom industry of the 21st century. And to a certain extent, I think that it has proven to be the case. Its success over the last 50, 60 years has just been extraordinary. You know, 25 years ago, would we have believed that HIV is now a chronic disease? you know, a disease that can be managed. And, you know, this came out of just this very, very successful enterprise. But, and there's an important but here, every year 
the expectation is that there will be more money, that there will be more jobs, that there will be more students produced. You cannot continue that indefinitely. That at some point you're going to have to be something approximating steady state as opposed to continuous growth. So what are the drivers here? One is the pharmaceutical industry. And the pharmaceutical industry is going through a very difficult patch right now where it is pulling back from doing in-house research. Biotech, which are you know, those feisty little startups that you know, uh, start with a great idea, um, are still being created every day out of the great research universities, thank heaven, because that's the translation of research that's, that is so important, I think. Um, for the future. Um, but those sort of exist for a while, and more often than not, they get bought up by the pharmaceutical industry, which is using them as their research arm. Let me make sure I understand this. We are dedicated and have been for a while money from the people of the United States, federal money, to finance first class university research. And that research is. The, the dynamo that creates new products, new breakthroughs that the pharmaceutical companies and others use. Correct. Right. Exactly correct. Now, is there anything wrong with that picture? No, I think the picture is, is, a, um, is the right picture, but it's really critical that we understand that the role of the universities is to do the groundbreaking paradigm shifting kind of work that then can be translated often through these little startup biotech companies to the pharmaceutical companies. So absolutely that is the right model. The question that you're interested in is how big should that enterprise be and how many well-trained brilliant scientists do we need to feed that ecosystem. And the worry, I think, right now in biomedical science is that we are training too many scientists that can be absorbed by this ecosystem. Well, to a skeptical viewer at home, isn't it? Well, it can't be that if you graduate with a PhD in science, that you'll have a hard time finding a job. You will not have difficulty finding a job. I think the question that I would ask as a taxpayer is, is the work you're going to do in that job a, a payback for the federal investment in your very lengthy training? Because one of the symptoms of the pathology in the system right now is the length of training that it takes to get from a beginning graduate student to someone who has what we would think of as a real job in the real economy. And that number has been growing and growing and growing, and it's strictly market determined. In other words, as it gets harder and harder to find one of those jobs, you stay in training positions longer and longer and longer. And I refer to this phenomenon as circling LaGuardia and they're waiting for their turn to land. And in this case, the landing is getting a position either in you know, academia or getting a position in industry or government. But if you add up all of those jobs, those jobs are smaller in number in terms of turnover than the number of PhDs we're producing. And so you have individuals who are 37, 38, 39 years old, arguably in the prime of their productive lives, earning less than the median income of the United States with a PhD and with years and years of, of post-PhD training. And a PhD in science, not... PhD in science. Not what some would call the soft studies. I, I, you know, I get into trouble if I use words like that in a university, so I'm going to avoid that one. But uh, I would understand. Yeah. Well, you've described the system very well. In this system, who loses in the system? You know, I think the system loses. 
I'm worried because I've spent years trying to talk the best Princeton undergraduates into thinking about going into science and to going to graduate school. And what I've seen over the last 25 years since I've been here is that that conversation is getting tougher and tougher and tougher. Because these are smart young men and women. And they take a look at circling LaGuardia. And they say, do I really want to be 38, 39 years old still in this training position um, earning a wage that will make it very difficult for me to you know, begin a middle class life. Um, I'm going to medical school, thank you very much. Or I'm going off uh, to Wall Street. Or I'm going to go do something else. And if we're not attracting those students into biomedical science, and those were the students who were going into biomedical science in my generation, I think the enterprise itself is going to suffer in the long term. And what happens to the country? What happens to our world leadership in science? I think that we are at risk because all you have to do is look at what is happening in the rest of the world. And, and I think particularly in Asia, but not exclusively in Asia, there the best and the brightest are going into science and are seeing careers in science as one of the you know, real uh, mechanisms for social mobility um, in, in those countries. And I think that the center of gravity of sort of scientific innovation, creativity, is going to move offshore if we are not paying close attention to this question. So here you have individuals who have dedicated their life to discovery. Uh, to doing as good science as they want to do it. Believe me, they are not doing it for the money. Um, they are doing it because they love it. And um, they are seeing their funding uh, being threatened and beginning to decline. And so, of course, they uh, are loath to give up an aspect of the system that has helped them do this great science that, frankly, I think is beginning to be exploitative of these young scientists that we're training. Now, in 1998, you led this national panel looking at this problem. And last year, you chaired another study panel <laughs> yeah. for NIH. What did you find in those studies that made you so concerned? The studies were remarkably consistent with one another. I would say the big difference between them was simply that in the 12 or 13 years between the two studies, the problem had become more severe and more exacerbated. So I think what we found is that although there is very low unemployment among PhDs in biomedical science, the number who are in positions now who are not taking any advantage of the education that the taxpayer paid for is growing, and it's growing rapidly. Well, and you made the studies twice. What has, <laughs> what has NIH done? Francis Collins, who is the director of the National Institutes of Health, has taken our recommendations, I think, very seriously, including increasing uh, the stipends for postdoctoral fellows who are supported by federal dollars so that they will um, become more expensive, but it will also mean that they are being compensated. Not yet where I think fairness would suggest they should be compensated, but at least better um, than they have been in the past. It, it, another really important recommendation that I think came out of our committee was to begin to think about the career, the training path as a leaky pipeline in the sense that instead of having every single graduate student do five or six years of PhD, then another five or six or seven or eight years of a postdoc, begin sort of creating off-ramps. Uh, not off-ramps that are unsuccessful, off-ramps that are actually successful. So encouraging recent PhDs to think about things to do other than to go on and be a postdoc, to think about science journalism. Uh, it's not going to be a big pool, as you know, 
we don't have many good science journalists left in this country, but boy, could we use some, uh, right? Exactly. Yeah, and, and sort of creating training opportunities for these well-trained scientists to use their science, but for things other than to continue down that path toward the, the smaller and smaller number of jobs that are at the end of that path. To that person in the living room might be saying, well, this is all mildly interesting, <laughs> and, uh, but I don't see how it affects me. I don't see how it affects my future. Here's how I think it affects your future. If you look at where did the growth in the American economy that characterized the second half of the 20th century, where did that growth come from? You know, estimates are anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the growth in the American economy in the second half of the 20th century came from investments in science and engineering. And so if you think about you know, the, the great companies that have been created, the, the, that have led to you know, an expansion of the workforce, um, those started with federal investments in science. And I think that that is a model that we give up at our peril. You know, as, as challenging as the health problems have been in the last century, you know, infectious disease, you know, where vaccines and antibiotics have really changed the whole landscape of infectious disease, uh, we're going to have some pretty big ones in the 21st century, including the, the consequence of being a much older population. And the issues are deep and profound and are going to have big economic impacts. And I think uh, our biomedical enterprises is, is well positioned as any to begin to make the same impact on the 21st century that it made on the 20th century.